Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's Phil Harris. I'm the manager of the NCDOT Environmental Analysis Unit. Uh, you are in room eight. Um, and this is the FHWA initiatives to deliver transportation more efficiently and with better compliance. If you are looking for a, another, if you didn't hear the, the title that you thought you would hear, then you're probably in another, supposed to be in another room. Um, wanted to just really introduce our, um, our speakers this morning, and as they come up, they are going to give you a more detail of, of uh, their, their place at, at FHWA. We have three folks here with us this morning from FHWA, and I think a fourth is going to be Bob Barker. And we have a lot. Um, Edward's here with FHWA. I see Donna Dancuzzi back there. Uh, with the, so we have a lot of FHWA representation this morning, but we have three speakers, uh, Mr. Brad Hibbs, Mr. George Hoops, and Mr. Clarence Coleman. So um, in the, what we'll do is they will present, and we will hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for questions. So with that, uh, Brad, I will turn it over to you, sir. And as you can tell, we have a poll question. So if you would go to Slido and uh, just to get an idea of who's in the room today, uh, enter the code and uh, answer the question that we have put up. If everyone has that, 919106. And uh, the question is, what role do you play? So. Uh, we'll give you a moment to look at that and we'll post that for you. And as you're filling it out, I think this is the, the first time in almost two years that this many Federal Highway people from our office have been in one room together. So it's good to see everyone. Um, missed you all. Um, and um, hope we can do this again soon. All right, you about ready to reveal? All right. I didn't vote, but I'm in the all of the above, uh, along with most everyone here in Federal Highway. We touch upon most every related topic uh, in preparation, project preparation, and then project execution. So that gives us an idea, uh, gives Federal Highway an idea of who's in the room. So if, if you're done, let me, let me move on. Thank you. Um, all right, so there are three of us who are presenting. I'm Brad Hibbs, um, as Phil said, and, and I'm the operations engineer. I'm responsible for everything that has federal funding in it from design through construction, uh, asset management, safety, local programs, payment materials, and structures. So that, that's my role. Uh, George Hoops will be coming to us next and talking about programmatic CE basics and, and finishing up with Clarence Coleman, who has a, a slew of uh, uh, discussion topics for you, uh, ending with, with new CEQ regulations. So uh, as, as we promised, we'll, we'll go through this presentation. We have a couple of more poll questions for you. Uh, and then we'll open it up for just general questions and, and uh, pass the microphone around since we're being recorded and we can uh, hear the, the questions uh, on the record and then, and then get the answer. All right, this is who we are. Um, we, we are almost fully staffed right now. Uh, we, uh, if, you, if you look, you see four, well, first of all, you met John Sullivan yesterday, our division administrator. Uh, Edward Parker, our deputy division administrator is here. Edward, can you raise your hand? That's Edward. Uh, under Edward, we, we have um, uh, finance. We have a new financial manager, Robert Moore. Uh, he took Audrey Davis's uh, position. Audrey is happily retired and onto a new, new step in her career. Uh, George is in charge of planning and program development. Uh, Clarence, pre-construction, and as I said, operations. I have a vacancy right now. Um, I was sad to, to lose um, Aaron Williams. Uh, he got a promotion to our Texas division. He's in the state for probably a few more weeks, and then he and his wife and child are going to relocate to Austin. So we wish him the best. Uh, we're going to replace him through our training program. We're also getting a new employee. Uh, that's almost here, Brandon Oliver, uh, working mm -hmm. and planning under George. He's coming off of our training program, and so we're, we're anxious for him to arrive. All right. 
So uh, I have another uh, knowledge check, and this is related to stewardship and oversight. So can we go to that? You have a, should have a new question coming up. And that question is, uh, oversight of a delegated federal aid project means that I, and then you can fill in that, that question. And John Sullivan uh, spoke on this yesterday uh, about what delegation means, but we're going to reinforce that and talk about, I'll be talking about our stewardship and oversight agreement just a little bit uh, before I turn it over to George. So take a moment, make a selection. <coughs> All right, everyone about done. Let's see what, what we're what we're getting. All right. So, yeah, the answer is, is C, that uh, you need to act as if you're, you're one of the Federal Highway Division um, uh, representatives uh, when you're making these decisions. Uh, treating it like a state project uh, is, is easy, straightforward, but uh, unfortunately you could run into some issues if there's an audit and we find that there are any federal regulations or laws that have not been followed or any improper payments. I'll be talking about that in just a minute. Um, at, and, and you can contact us uh, if you have any questions. If you have a delegated decision, we are happy and anxious to answer your questions. Now, of course, you'll get an answer, um, but uh, that, that is the best way to resolve any, any concern or, or, or concern about inconsistency or anything that's nebulous to you. Uh, call us and we'll help make that clear. Um, and and I, I have to say this for, for my office, I won't say it for you, but uh, just having someone who knows what happened uh, is, is not sufficient to document because people have an unfortunate uh, tendency to retire and go away. And unfortunately, I've not found a way to transfer the knowledge from someone's brain into a, uh, a documented file. So, uh, and John mentioned this yesterday, we, we need documentation of all these decisions. Uh, for the time that comes around when there is an audit or a review. Okay, let's, let's move on from that. The stewardship and oversight agreement that was uh, updated uh, pr probably actually uh, this year. Uh, the last major update uh, was back in 2015. Uh, we've heard rumor that we're going to update it again, maybe this year, maybe next. But, but this document does two things. It tells what roles we all play in the development of a federal aid project. And then the second thing that it does is, is say, who has a responsibility for the decision making? That's important because as John mentioned yesterday, uh, the, the stewardship and oversight agreement helps move projects faster. And the way it moves projects faster is that you're not waiting for us to make or approve a decision or come behind you and, and document a decision. That's been delegated to you. Now that doesn't mean that I am absolved of all responsibility for that as, as our USDOT OIG repeatedly tells me. Uh, it means that I'm still responsible but that the North Carolina DOT has the resources and the knowledge available to make that decision in our place. It also means that when everything is said and done, uh, that uh, when we get to the end and there's an audit, um, and it could be either a, an audit from our office, it could be a program aud audit from NCDOT, uh, from, from USDOT or Federal Highway and Headquarters, or it could be from our OIG, that if every decision has been properly documented and you follow federal law and regulation, everything's good. But as John said yesterday, if we get to this point and we find that there's an improper payment, if there is an area where you didn't realize that, that you had to follow federal regulation or you didn't know what that was, uh, then, then it's a little bit too late for us to be able to make an adjustment and usually it could mean, uh, usually it does mean a loss of funding and that's what we all want to avoid. Um, one, one, one important thing that I want to say is, you know, some of you may say, where is this stewardship and oversight agreement? Well, if you go to our website and you go under uh, our programming section and under infrastructure, you'll find a link not only to the oversight, stewardship and oversight agreement for North Carolina, you could find it for practically every state DOT uh, that's available and, and has been made available through a link. So that's where you can find it. 
Uh, there's also a supplement where you can find additional information just for NCDOT, uh, where there's a more supporting documentation. And, and uh, if you find us afterward, we can help you locate that and where that is. But that was developed jointly by the Federal Highway North Carolina Division Office and uh, by NCDOT. Okay, so if I'm still responsible for this and George and Clarence and everyone in our, in our office are still responsible for all the decisions on federal aid projects that have been delegated or the decision making has been delegated to NCDOT, how do we know or how do we check to make sure that everything's done properly? And that is accomplished through our risk-based project improvement uh, methodology that's just been updated through guidance given us to, to us from headquarters and that I, along with uh, the North Carolina Division Office, will be uh, developing new guidelines for that. But it's essentially a three-step process. The first is project screening. And for, for us to, pro to, to screen all the projects that are active and have federal aid funds, we have to know what they are. And that sounds like that's easy, but as I found last year through an OIG audit on change orders, uh, when they asked for every active federal aid project for the calendar years of 2017, 18, and 19, that's easier said than done. Um, what I hoped would only take a few days actually took a few weeks while the OIG was literally you know, doing that, waiting for me to get back to them. So that's the first challenge, is for us to go out and, and agree with you what projects are federally funded that are active. Uh, after we have um, developed that uh, database, then we have to screen projects. Not, not every one, but we have to go through the active ones that we know about. Division by division, central office, local projects, uh, projects in other um, uh, DOT agencies, you know, ferry boat projects uh, that have federal funding in them and decide what are the projects that, ha that have the highest risk. Some of that's already been defined for us. Uh, major projects uh, have to be on that list. Uh, grant funded projects should be on that list. Uh, anything that's unusual or unique um, or that just inherently has, has um, uh, a risk. You know, one, one example that we've been following are, are the, the bridge projects on NC-12. Uh, not, not because of any constructability, but because of all the effort that went through to get the environmental agreements and to make sure that they're implemented, that was the risk that we, we chose to look at. Uh, and then I have to develop a, a uh, it used to be I just kept all this on a spreadsheet. Now I have to have an individual plan for each project that, that is identified as, as risk. Uh, in addition to that, John mentioned our compliance assessment program where, where projects are selected randomly from our headquarters office and, and we have to go through 10 core questions for each of those projects to test compliance. And then any project or program uh, that uh, also requires a special review, we're going to look at. And, and I want to mention, just to, as, as I turn this over to George, we have some new tools. NCDOT has developed a project let manual. Uh, which has a great uh, spr uh, uh, checklist in the appendix that uh, you can use in the divisions to, to answer the question, what, uh, what do I need to document and comply with as, I de as I'm developing a project? IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, that's um, uh, what you would call a, a, a division led or, or a, a, a project that, that uh, has a, a, you know, a special uh, aspect to it that, that we have just worked with NCDOT to develop a procedure for. Um, we're going to go out with a lot of training, hopefully face-to-face -face in the spring, and talking about uh, uh, these processes. Uh, we also provide assistance and, and some oversight to close out local projects. Uh, Tammy Richards, who's on my team, works closely with each NCDOT division and the NCDOT central office to manage this program. And so these, these are some of the, the tools that we are using we want to make you aware of uh, as I turn this over to George to make sure that when we come to the end and there's an audit or a check uh, that we have followed every um, federal aid program and procedure uh, and, and made sure that there's going to be no improper payments. So next, I'm going to turn it over to George, who's going to talk to you about programmatic category exclusion basics. So George, why don't you come on up? Good morning. Uh-oh, what am I stepping on? 
My name is George Hoops, Planning and Program Development Manager here in North Carolina Division of Federal Highway. And as Brad said, we're going to go over programmatic categorical exclusion um, and the delegation of authority. This, what Brad talked about with how in North Carolina, this programmatic CE agreement is used by over 95% of the NEPA documents that are developed. And of those, the vast majority are delegated. Okay. So, so what I'm gonna do, Brad, how did you move it forward? Use the arrow key. Use the arrow key. The arrow down key or arrow up key. It's not working. <laughs> but what we're gonna do is have a uh, interactive session now where I ask some questions, provide yeah, some, right some different answers and see how you react. If, if you answer, if you're brave enough to answer, you'll get a prize. I kind of raided my closet this morning and got some uh, different, whether it's gummy be, you know, different, different uh, things, whether it's Rice Krispie treats and other things. So, so with that said, when must a PCE be developed for a transportation project? When NCDOT is planning to construct activities on the interstate? When there is a federal nexus? When NCDOT would like uh, Federal Highway to be the lead agency? Or all of the above? And somebody raise your hand. The, go ahead. All the above. And by the way, the one thing I didn't mention was that a number of these that I came up for questions were based on some of the feedback we've received, the questions we've received from both NCDOT as well as consultants. And as part of this delegation of authority, yes, thank you. As part of this delegation of authority, what we, what we have is NCDOT's EPU unit does a annual review of these delegated projects to see how well they're done. And so these may look simple, but in some cases we're getting a number of questions about them. And unfortunately the answer is when there's a federal nexus. And you may ask what a federal nexus would be. That's a federal aid approval or authorization. In terms of approval, if you, one of them would be one that Joe does all the time, and that's an interstate access uh, recommendation approval. And then the other would be an authorization such as a authorization for right-of-way or construction. Now, number three, when NCDOT would like FHWA to be the lead, certainly the question asked, when must? But in the, in the case of when may, if you would like us to be the lead, we will certainly be there to help when you need it. Or if it's a delegated project, you can certainly do that, put that in your file with other records, and we'll probably say the word, put all your documentation in the file multiple times throughout this. Um, so with that, thank you for your response. So it's a right key. Yeah? Yes, yes. So is the arrow, the right arrow key? What is? I just don't know how to commute a computer. Or I just didn't watch it. Oh, that one. Well, there's two arrows. Nice. All right. So under what circumstance does NCDOT certify the CE and seek FHWA approval? When the project is a ground disturbing type one with the threshold criteria being marked. And for those that did not say they worked in NEPA, the threshold criteria would be like a type two or type three CE checklist where there's a gray box checked. Or a ground disturbing type two CE with impact thresholds marked no. Or type three CEs, all of the above or none of the above. Yes, sir. Number two. Number two. Um, this is, so, and thank you for your answer. So ground disturbing type one CEs when impact thresholds are marked yes is really one of the answers for when we need to be approving these documents as well as in all cases a type three you would need to be, uh, NCDOT would be certifying, sending it to Federal Highway for our approval. So um, 
where, and, and that's because we're talking about unusual circumstances. W one interesting thing, and as Clarence and I worked with NCDOT on the development of, on the CE agreement, we were trying to figure out the threshold criteria and to make, hit a sweet spot as to, to what extent we could delegate the majority of projects where they were low risk. And we hit a really good sweet spot since, um, as I said before, the majority of these projects are being processed under delegation, as in NCDOT is doing the approval for us. Thank heavens I finally know where the arrow is. Ah. All right. Oh. Oh, gosh. All right. So that's the now. Who can certify and or approve the CE? Select all that apply. Consulting firm, qualified NCDOT staff, and this is an approval. Local government staff, other staff, state agency staff, uh, approval not required or none of the above. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. Yes, in fact, the, the reason this is up there, because many a times, especially at a time when we have many grants that are going to local government entities, unfortunately, they are unable to use, and this agreement doesn't allow for the use by them directly where they're approving. That would need to be, so there is no additional delegation beyond NCDOT. So thank you for that. All right. NCDOT, now this is just a fact, no question. <laughs> NCDOT is responsible for ensuring all of the following processes are complete for the projects that qualify as a CE, including identify applicable listed CE, ensuring any conditions or constraints are met, verifying that unusual circumstances do not apply, addressing environmental requirements, and approval signature. And I'd like to add one more. Very important, Brad said it before, and I just want to piggyback on it, and I may end up saying it a few times, and that is, no matter what you know, if it's not in your project file, it didn't happen. And unfortunately, like Brad said, you or others may not be in that position anymore and have knowledge of what happened. And it may take a few years for something to occur where you need that information. So please, uh, utilize and provide, especially consultants, provide NCADOT with these documents in order to tell the story that backs up your CE. All right, next one is a question. What documentation should be included in the appendix of a CE? Section 106, all good stuff. Section 106 reports, uh, natural resource technical reports, agency determination uh, correspondence, Project mapping, section 4F letter from officials with jurisdiction, this one's specific to de minimis, which we get a number of them. Uh, completed right away reports or no documentation required. Yes, sir. I'll take a stab at it. I'll take Thank you. Number, number one. Well, and thank you. <laughs> You know, I was very worried when I came here. I'm like, man, everybody's gonna get every one of them. This is, um, that is good information for the project file. And that's kind of why I mentioned it before. I'm gonna have a slide on document, another slide on documentation, possibly. Um, your project file is just as good as your appendices. So therefore, these large documents can go in the project file. I would suggest from agency determination correspondence, that's say your 106 letters from Renee with a determination, or your fish and wildlife letters, a project map showing the footprint of the project is the project mapping, and of course, like a de minimis letter with concurrence from those with jurisdiction over that land that's under 4F, um, that meets the 4F requirement. Those are good in the actual document. And I'll give you just a rule of thumb that I heard John Williams say many years ago, and we agree with it, and that is when he did the training, I believe in 2017, and that is um, if it's a type three CE, it should be under 30 pages, 25 pages. If it's a type one or type two CE, it should probably no more than 10 pages, you know? All of this other documentation that may be very good information that you relied upon in your decision making, 
can be in the project file, NCDOT's project file. So thank you. Okay, section 4F approval is required under what circumstance? A transportation project being constructed solely with state or local funds, a project intended to address non-transportation purposes, or that. <laughs> I think I'm going dry. Uh, a a federally funded project requiring, and, and hopefully for those that work in NEPA, you, you know the rest of this sentence. So what would you think the response would be? Yes, thank you. It is three. Remember that if there's no federal aid funding. Now, if you're doing a, a uh, well, I'll leave it there. Three. Okay. What are the criteria that must be met to make a de minimis determination? Avoidance, minimization, mitigation measures that were relied upon. The public, and has been, the public has been given an opportunity to provide comments. The officials with jurisdiction have been notified by US DOTs of US DOTs intent to make a de minimis determination and have concurred. NCDOT concurs with the de minimis finding or all of the above. Boy, a lot of people spoke. I don't know how you gave things out to the rest. And now this, that, I only got like 10 things in there. My wife doesn't give me many treats. All right, uh, the answer is one, two, and three. And the one thing I want to note here, which isn't anywhere on the slide, but I get a number of questions, and our whole team gets a number of questions regarding public involvement and what that needs to look like. And regarding public involvement, it doesn't need to be a public meeting. It doesn't need to be a public hearing. It can be a newspaper advertisement. But it also can be a, a notice on a publicly accessible bulletin board or on a publicly accessible project website. These things are all adequate for meeting your, avail or your ability to seek and gain input from the public. Give them the opportunity to comment. All right. So this is one that I added because a few years ago, uh, Brad had a cap review that actually included something about NEPA final documentation. And unfortunately, a number of projects did not have consultations. So when is a consultation required to be complete? When a year has passed before the CE, between when the CE was signed and right of way? When more than a year has lapsed between the CE being complete or approved and the construction authorization? When the approved action is less than a year and there's substantial changes? All the above or none of the above? Go ahead. Four. All of the above. Thank you. And I, and I just want to note on this, unfortunately, if you have these activities happening in series, saying that you go, you do your, your, uh, your initial NEPA document, a year has passed, you go to right of way. Another year has passed. Unfortunately, you'll be doing another consultation just to confirm that the existing determination remains valid. Also, one thing here is substantial change. When in doubt, look at the PCE agreement. There's a discussion of what a substantial change, and I'll read it here, a project limit or footprint change, a number of lane change, a threshold criteria not being met. So it's, there's, there's, and if you're not sure, and this is something I, in practicing you mention in your brain, but you don't do it here, unfortunately, and that is call us. Ask us the question. You're about to do a consultation. You don't know whether, oh, and maybe, yeah, okay. When is it approved? So I jumped ahead of myself. Uh, when do you need FHWA to approve? So it, it kind of, it falls in line with that. 
the fact that um, reach out to us if you don't know if something's a substantial change or not and whether we need to be involved. So that gets at a type one with a substantial change. So I'm, I'm giving you the answer. And a type three. All the time, doesn't matter whether it's a substantial change or not, if you meet the criteria, you need to do it for that. And then, now, Clarence Coleman can come up. <laughs> wow. Can't believe it. It's that one, Clarence. This one right here? Okay. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. Right. The little. All right. Let's take this off a little bit. Let's see. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Clarence Coleman, uh, the Pre Construction and Environment Director uh, in our office um, here in North Carolina. Um, I worked for NCDOT for 10 years and now been on the federal side for 20. It's unbelievable, really. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, project initiation uh, scoping, which is kind of part of project initiation, and just briefly touch on the, the uh, new CEQ regulations. Uh, when it comes to project in initiation, uh, the biggest benefit that our office can provide uh, our transportation partners is um, the identification of key issues. You're, you're better off doing that at the earliest stage of the project. And I'll touch on some examples as we move forward. Um, you identify the key issues and then you lay out the steps toward re resolving those issues. And that, and that to me is the essence of NEPA. Um, issue identification, issue resolution. Um, as it relates to the, the PDN as part of the integrated uh, project delivery effort uh, that's been underway for NCDOT for the last number of years, uh, we can participate in the development of express designs, um, project scoping reports. All it takes is just uh, emails, um, phone calls to our office to participate in that effort. One of the key aspects of um, project development is schedules. Um, you know, I'll touch on the, the new CEQ updates. Um, updated regulations which are related to, you probably heard about the executive order that President Trump put out uh, as far as, um, um, you know, with the EISs being completed in a couple of years and, and so on. Uh, but the project schedules, um, coordination on schedule, development of schedules, coordination on, on schedules is very important with our interagency partners. And that's something that FHWA can can help lead uh, that effort uh, along with uh, NCDOT. Um, as part of scoping, uh, as you identify those issues and work uh, towards steps towards resolution, um, that will help determine um, the class of action. And what that means is whether or not uh, a project can quali could qualify uh, for a CE under our agreement. And um, and we've done that. Uh, our group, uh, the project development and um, the pre-construction and environment group with, uh, within our office, which I, um, which I cover, um, we work on merger projects. And, um, and just because a project goes through merger doesn't mean that we're going to do an environmental assessment uh, or an EIS. Uh, we have done a number of CEs, and we've explained the logic uh, to our uh, to our interagency partners, and um, but in our instances uh, with widening projects and interchange projects, um, there is an aspect of our CEQ regulations that allow for a documented CE. You document that the project does not have any significant impacts, and uh, so so just uh, keep that in mind and and. Um, so as, as far as a class of action decisions, which could uh, save time as far as your overall project schedule, a lot of that, yeah, most of that's going to be based on the issues uh, under uh, early project, initi under project initiation. Uh, merger screening, kind of talked about that. 
Um, now it's time I could get into an example, and I have a, a someone who's with the NCDOT now, and uh, so he's um, uh, worked in our office for a number of years, and uh, so we had a project um, in Johnston County um, along the along I forty. Uh, excuse me, it's NC forty two. Uh, wound up, which has an interchange. NC forty two has an interchange with I forty. It's a 10 mile project and it's widening. Um, so you're gonna get into uh, some, you're gonna have impacts associated with it. And I think the original scope, um, the original intent, intent was to have an EA for that project. I think DOT had pretty much designated that as an, as an uh, EA project, uh, followed by an anticipated Fonzie. So once we looked at it, and we've had a number of, uh, like I said, I worked for NCDOT for 10 years, uh, worked with NEPA, and uh, the, uh, worked, had a number of years under my belt with FHWA. And one thing that we had seen is that uh, we had a number of widening projects, which, which we had done environmental assessments, but we had the empirical data to support the CEs because they were followed by Fonzies, which is, a finding of no significant impact. So that, in part, provides us the supporting data, the empirical data that could be supportive of making CE determinations for, in particular, for widening projects, which the NC42 project, which which it was a it, which was a widening project. So once we looked at that, um, we made a determination that uh, okay, this was a strong CE candidate. We did some coordination. It did follow up and we went through merger uh, screening and lo and behold, the project was screened out of merger. Uh, much because of the same reasoning because once we got into identifying those key issues, it really came down to minimizing impacts uh, to streams and wetlands for the most part. And we were gonna do that anyway. Okay, so we don't need to go through and confirm purpose and need. Um, so that, wound up being a project where we completed NEPA from project initiation um, to a signed CE document in nine months. And I will tell you that we would not have done that um, on, you know, if we had done an EA uh, followed by a FONSI. And um, the project may have ultimately, ultimately may have uh, gone through merger, but it just shows that when you have robust project initiation and coordination, uh, you can get uh, things done a little bit faster. And it uh, doesn't mean it's not effective, but it does get uh, faster. So if it's effective, shorter period of time, is just being efficient. So um, kind of touched on the coordination with the agencies there. Um, as you uh, identify key issues, um, you know, the issues that come up, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the, the Bonner Bridge project <laughs> because, uh, you know, I have really haven't given any discussions on that because we were under litigation. I see Brian Yamamoto back there. <laughs> so we were under litigation uh, for so long, you know, and every public comment, every note, every email, every emoji that you could come up with <laughs> um, has, you know, is scrutinized by, uh, by litigants uh, as far as going through all our files with FOIA requests and and all that, so you have to really be careful in what you say. But as we had issue after issue, um, we had to coordinate with the agencies. Um, you know, for Bonner Bridge, uh, the cost estimate came into play, and rightfully so, because the project was underestimated for a long time. And uh, so we had to go through and resolve that issue, and we did, we hired some independent, I think it was three, a total of three independent uh, contractors to develop um, uh, cost estimates and presented that information to all our resource agency partners and said, here it is, here's the updated costs, um, which I think we had said that the long bridge, the 17 mile bridge uh, would be around 600 million and then it kind of wound up being uh, double that. So you have to really try to build some trust after you have a, um, a cost estimate that uh, you know, that increases by a factor of two. So, so we, you know, but that's an example of resolving an issue. Um, and in that case, it was the, it was the cost estimates. 
We've had a couple of projects where that are you know along the coast. Sea level rise is going to be an issue. Okay, and um, uh, so as we continue to have coastal projects, that may be an issue. Uh, that's something that early coordination. The, the sooner we get um, our hands around that issue, uh, discuss methodologies associated with it. All we have to do is make sure we document that uh, we had given a hard look uh, to that particular issue as part of the uh, decision making process and provided the public public and resource agencies an opportunity to weigh in on it. So that's all related to the resolution of issues. Just want to briefly uh, discuss uh, for EIS level projects. Um, and the CEQ regulations kind of go beyond just EISs, but just wanted to touch touch on this because um, we had some new CEQ regs that were uh, that became effective in September of 2020, and it does involve uh, coordination uh, with the agencies on the EIS schedule, um, and uh, it has new uh, notice of intent requirements. And uh, again, Brian and. Uh, I guess Eric Metcalf is in here somewhere. They they will tell you that it wasn't your typical notice of intent, which I've issued a number of them. Uh, we've done a number of EISs here in North Carolina. Um, I've had the pleasure of issuing a lot of a lot of notices. This was a new process for notices no, uh, for notices of intent. Um, so um, it involves really putting together um, a mini environmental document uh, where you talk about purpose and need, present that information. You talk about, you discuss uh, the development of alternatives. And uh, so you present all that information in, um, in a supplementary document that's kind of look at it as it as, it, as a, um, an attachment to the actual federal notice that you would read. You would kind of click on it, and then you would have pretty much a 30, 30 to 40 page document that explains all that stuff. The, the new regulations do allow a lot, um, for pre-NOI notice of intent um, coordination. And uh, for us, uh, based on the advice of John Sullivan, um, we got all the way through uh, concurrence point two with uh, concurrence on alternatives uh, prior to issuing the notice. Um, so of course, there's a two year window after the notice, so it's beneficial to have as much coordination as possible pre-NOI, uh, but, uh, but with that, there was a lot of information to share uh, in that supplementary document that's, uh, that's attached to that notice of intent, that Federal Register notice. So just wanted to, to briefly touch on that. And um, the other thing that's kind of a carryover to the one federal decision executive order uh, that I alluded to earlier with uh, issued by President Trump, um, it's still the new CEQ regs do um, uh, heavily um, suggest that we uh, look at ways to issue one federal decision for EISs um, if, if possible, to the, to the extent possible. In the case of the core, uh, we have a project that we worked on, um, the Carolina Bay's uh, Parkway Extension uh, project, in uh, which we uh, uh, issued a notice uh, recently. And uh, the core is set to issue its own. There's going to be a lot of heavy coordination with the core. They're reviewing our environmental documents um, and so on. But uh, we're going to. Have to do heavy coordination, but because of their requirements, we're not going to actually issue one uh, rod, but they will be able to follow up with, uh, conclude their NEPA process shortly after we conclude ours. So with that, um, I will invite my colleagues up, up uh, maybe to answer some questions or Phil, did you have, have something? Yeah, okay. I was just going to, we're going to take questions. <laughs> okay. Clarence is right. You know. okay. What we'll do, we've got uh, we've got maybe 15 minutes, and a really good, really good presentation by by Brad, George, and Clarence. So let's give them a round of applause. Um, what we can do, do you, George? Do you have the other uh, microphone, or there it is back there? Uh, what we'll do is we can.
take a question and we'll we'll give it to whomever wants to answer it. So anybody in the audience want to ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anybody want to answer that, Clarence? Or is it is that a, is that a DOT yeah, I think, uh, yeah. place to answer that? Yeah, I think it probably be more appropriate for someone from DOT. But uh, you know, just taking um, or Ron would probably be a good person. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but the idea with the um, um, with the the interchange project, as I understand it, was actually part of another study. It was the I I pro, interstate project yes. that was done. The one I was talking about specifically was the one that kind of leads um, uh, to the interchange as a ten mile span. But the whole idea, those projects uh, collectively will address uh, the traffic problems in that area. So that that's um, kind of my thirty thousand foot response to that. But the whole idea is that the the project um, that I'm, I was speaking of, the ten mile project, will help w relieve congestion leading to I forty uh, from the, the more rural area. And then um, the the actual interstate project that uh, for some reason is just escaping me the actual step number, but uh, what was it? Forty-seven thirty-nine. Forty-seven I forty-seven thirty-nine. That's the one that's actually being worked on right now. That will help address uh, things in the immediate uh, vicinity of I forty, and then the other project will be more um, will help with the um, uh, de decreasing congestion. Uh, getting out to the more rural area, the residential areas beyond the interchange. Thank you, Clarence. Um, good question. Uh, anybody else? We've got some time if anybody else has a question. Yes, ma'am. Clarence, repeat the question, please. Um, the question is, has uh, NCDOT and Federal Highways um, discussed or considered or discussed NEPA assignment? I will tell you, yes, um, that has been considered uh, by both entities. And the response that we've gotten from NCDOT that, um, you know, from the NCDOT leadership was they would rather have us as a transportation partner as we get through the NEPA process. So that that's based on the current leadership and the, and based that's the response we've gotten so thank you and with 95 percent of the program being developed as ces and a significant number of them being delegated you you really have only a very small portion of the program that is actually not delegated thank you clarence and george um Probably could have time for a couple more questions. Anybody have anything? Yes, John. I think I, I think your question: any um, potential changes with the Buy America? Yes, but we haven't received guidance on that. That's uh, part of the new infrastructure bill. Uh, and that's, that's how we've been trained to respond until we do receive guidance. Uh, I've been told there's electric shock and I want to avoid that. So, um, but, but there, there will be some changes. I don't know how significant and I, I, I will not tread upon that territory other than answer your question in the affirmative. Thank you, John, for that good question. Um, any more questions? Yes, sir. Quick question for George. Any update regarding census basic information and changing the basic MSA boundaries and possibility of some NGOs expanding new NGOs being created in North Carolina? Do you have any updates on that? Repeat the question. 
So census data, and I'll just say census data when it's going to come out, as well as guidance. And I, in talking to Jill Stark, who used to work in our division, um, now in headquarters, she said there's going to be possibly, possibly, I haven't received this officially, but another year delay in the data coming out. They're still working through it, working on it, and trying to confirm it. So yes, we instead of 2022, we'll probably get it um, late summer of 23, I believe. But that isn't official. I have not received an email from our headquarters on that. So you, you're not you're going to get shocked because that was not official. <laughs> Thanks, George. Good question. Um, any more questions? No, we, we have one more poll question before we. Okay. Looks like uh, the question: What part of the federal project development process do you need the most help? And if you can take some time and answer this, we're, we're collecting this information and taking it back with us, uh, so that. Please, please answer this because we are collecting this information and using it to prepare to go out to each NCDOT division, central office, MPOs, uh, all of our, all the partners that we can to provide training and, and guidance that we hope in the near future will be face to face meetings and training such as this one, except of course on a smaller scale where we will just uh, work in coordination uh, for all phases of project development uh, to provide answers to your questions about where do I find that, what federal requirements am I supposed to follow if it's different from, you know, that I treat the federal project different from a state project, and uh, who do I call if I have an issue. So that's, that's the information that we're going to get out to you, and this, this will help us start. Thank you for that, Brad. Any more questions? If not, we will we will um, adjourn the uh, the next session in here will be the last session before lunch. It'll be from ten thirty to eleven thirty. Um, there's the PDH signups, as I understand, or, or as you exit. Um, and um, thank y'all for being here. And again, thanks thanks that to the FHWA for for a great presentation. <laughs>